I'm on uh, three panels, uh, one today and two tomorrow. Uh, they all generally focus on the security issues with North Korea, uh, and that's somewhat disaggregated into those who are really, uh, I think, interested in the technical side of denuclearization and, and others who are sort of interested in the larger picture. Where, where is the U.S.-North Korea relationship going? How does it relate to the Republic of Korea? and its interests in a future relationship with the DPRK. So it's all on the security issue. I think it's a fair question to ask. Uh, if anything, I'm unhappy that many in the United States, at least, are certain they know the answer to your question. I am certain that I do not know the answer. I have thoughts about it because I, as you say, have been watching this program um, since the early 1990s. Uh, the program is quite old. Uh, in other words, the North Koreans began to pursue a nuclear weapons capability as far back as the 1980s, some would say even sooner. So it's, it's 30 years old or so. Uh, and uh, I, I think there are some elements of continuity over the 30 years. Uh, that's not to say that Kim Il-sung had exactly the same perception as his son, Kim Jong-il, or that he had the same perception as the current chairman, Kim, Kim Jong-un. But I think all of them uh, were first interested in having um, a way to prevent uh, the overthrow of their regime. Mm -hmm. that regime survival has always been important to the leadership in Pyongyang and still is. Uh, and from a North Korean perspective, and I've been told this by many North Koreans and in lots of different settings in many cities, that they look at what the United States has done in other countries where it has been unhappy with um, one regime or another regime, and they see a rather, at times, aggressive American policy. Uh, so the overthrow of Saddam's government, for example, the overthrow of Gaddafi's government is a second example. They point to these cases and say, we don't want to be case number three. Uh, and nuclear weapons for the North Koreans, whatever else they may mean, certainly mean that they provide a deterrent to regime change. And that, I think, is the key. Now, I'm not saying that is all that's involved here, that they don't have um, more aggressive purposes with having nuclear weapons to intimidate, to blackmail. Maybe that, too. But certainly, I think, at base, there is a deterrent objective. In a general way, I've always thought that there were um, only three options for the U.S. to deal with North Korea. Um, there was a military option, which would be very, very costly for Koreans and Americans, um, and it should not be favored by anyone as a first course. Then there is containment, which the United States has pursued, along with South Korea, f on and off for 30 years or more. Um, that can avoid war, but it doesn't resolve the issue, and intermittently the North Koreans have launched various provocations at sea and on land, uh, and containment is a fallback position, but not a very happy one for anyone. It leaves the peninsula divided, the Korean people divided, and a high degree of tension between the North Koreans and the United States. The favored way of proceeding that we keep coming back to uh, is to find a negotiated way of removing tension between the North and the U.S., ultimately between the North and the South, to achieve a political resolution which meets the security objectives of North Korea, South Korea, the United States, and China, and Japan, 
that's really uh, the, the issue. Is there a way of getting to that outcome? Uh, is there a, is this a, a set of intersecting circles where there is a sweet spot that if we have a successful negotiation, we can define a relationship between these countries uh, that would support this outcome? That's what I think, in a way, we have always been looking for. Mm -hmm. Certainly, when I was a negotiator 25 years ago, I thought I was, that was the road we were on. I hoped we were anyway. It somehow, somehow seems to me inappropriate that I should be giving advice to governments. Um, I know what I, I think is a reasonable way to proceed um, for the United States. Um, and that is uh, for us to begin by recognizing this is a security issue for all of us, for North Korea, for South Korea, for China, for Japan, for the United States, and that we have to take care of our security as the number one starting objective. That means for the United States, our alliance with South Korea and our alliance with Japan. So we start by saying, how do we solve the problem with North Korea? First, we protect our alliances. Right? And now we can go on to the second step. Well, what else? Well, we, it's hard for me to imagine a positive result, a peaceful resolution to these tensions that does not involve engagement, negotiations, discussions. And we can talk about whether they're five-party talks or two-party talks. Do the Russians come? Do the Japanese come? Are the South Koreans in the room or outside the room? We can have all those discussions. But the two parties that have to be in the room, the DPRK and the USA. Right? So we have to get together bilaterally uh, with the North. I have no objection to a larger regional context, but at, at the heart of the issue is the relationship between the North Koreans and the United States. I mean, right now, for example, I think if the U.S. and the DPRK relationship were working well, then there'd be great progress between the North and the South. Um, it is the failure of the U.S. and the North Koreans to, to make the deal that needs to be made either in Singapore and Hanoi or someplace else that prevents the North and the South from doing the business they want to do together. So the US and the North Koreans have to get together, engage over a period of time. Uh, this is a third point, and that is that nothing can happen quickly that's going to be durable. You can have a, a summit if you want in Singapore, you can have a summit in Hanoi. Summits are nice. Uh, but from my perspective, work doesn't get done at a summit. Summits endorse something. You don't make complicated deals at a summit. Uh, usually those deals are worked out, hammered out at the working level by professionals and are presented to the leaders in two countries or more countries. Leaders come together and they endorse. They say, yes, that's what we want to do. But to ask Chairman Kim and President Trump to come to a meeting and talk about denuclearization. I mean, I used to do this for a living and now I teach about it. It's complicated stuff, right? So I think you need engagement at the working level. You need serious negotiations that go on. I don't mean for hours or days, I mean for months to years. So we've got to get to that point. And <clears throat> then finally, we have to recognize that no matter how much we might want trust to exist between the North Koreans and the South Koreans and the North Koreans and the United States, there's not going to be trust for a very long time. In the meantime, we can do arrangements, we can do understandings, we can do frameworks, we can even do treaties, but the elements of those arrangements must all be verifiable. Without a situation of trust, we must be able to verify. So verification of any arrangements having to do with denuclearization and normalization have to involve verification procedures. So we are sure that the reciprocal steps, that we are not only taking the steps that have to be taken, but they are taking the steps also.
Well, the, uh, I was chairman of USKI for a year. Uh, I will tell you that um, while that was rewarding to me because USKI I thought was a, um, a fine entity that uh, did a good job at what it was intended to do, located as it was at an American university. Uh, it is not um, KEI, which is another entity and much closer to the South Korean government. Uh, USKI was uh, as an institute of the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced National Studies in Washington, and it as such needed to be independent of the South Korean government. It no longer exists because it wouldn't compromise that independence. And for that, I am sorry that the South Korean government took the position that it did. That said, I think that uh, the South Korean government, the US government, uh, and others all benefit from um, NGOs and academic institutions that uh, create a dialogue over critical issues. So USKI would, for example, hosted a website, 38 North, very fine quality, uh, that now moved to the Stimson Center when USKI collapsed for lack of funding from the South Korean government. So that website contributes to everybody's understanding of what's happening uh, in North Korea and what the risks and opportunities are. That's very useful uh, to public understanding of the dynamics here. Um, the sessions that the uh, USKI would host, the venue it would provide for people coming from the South Korean government particularly to speak to experts in Washington in government and out of government was a tremendous uh, platform for South Koreans to exchange views with Americans outside of a governmental context. So I think uh, in a well-functioning uh, uh, international system, uh, there are lots of opportunities to exchange ideas where experts, whether they be academic or they be in the NGO community um, or they be governmental experts, the more they can interact one with the other, uh, the better the chances that we can avoid conflict and find peaceful ways of resolving issues that arise. Well, I, uh, this is my first uh, time on uh, Jeju, first time at the forum. Uh, I've heard about it, uh, and I'm very impressed, I must say, looking at the program. It just started today, so I haven't had an opportunity to be um, uh, part of panels as yet, but I'm very impressed with the people that were attracted, uh, that the convening power of Jeju is very impressive, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, a very useful exchange of views with my colleagues.